All right, we go to the microphone? Sound good? All right. So I'm here to talk to you um, about containers um, and a little bit of stuff that I've learned in the past year since getting into the container space. Um, so a little bit about my background. Um, these days I work as a developer advocate at a company called Mesosphere. Um, we employ most of the developers that work on Apache Mesos. Um, and I like to tell people that I really believe in open source infrastructure. And so that's how I ended up at Mesosphere. Um, not the other way around. Um, so I've been doing open source software for about 15 years. Um, started in my own little Linux users group. Got my first systems administration job that way where I was working part-time on a contract basis to rack servers. So I was doing that in the evenings, going into data centers with my little Debian install CD um, and installing servers. Um, and so that's sort of how I got my first Linux systems engineering role. Um, I then started working at HP several years later, and I spent time working on OpenStack. So I went from a lot of bare metal machines to doing a ton of virtualization virtual machines. Um, so after I was working at HP, I decided the next thing sort of up in the stack, I'm moving from like bare metal and Linux to virtual machines. I'm like, hey, I should check out this container space. And I've learned a lot of few things in these, this past year working in containers. Um, and the one thing that I, I learned as someone coming from operations is that there's a lot of crazy information about all the problems that containers solve and the things that they don't actually solve. Um, I'll talk to our sales guys, and I'm like, stop telling people that. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, so I worked on Ubuntu a lot, worked on systems. Um, so one of the first things I learned when I started working on containers is you now have all these different separate layers. You're no longer walking into a data center with, with a CD that has your operating system on it. Things are really hard. Like, there are these hard boundaries between the separation of things. So you've got the hardware that everything runs on. Um, this can be actual hardware that your company or organization has control over, um, or this can be in the form of a cloud. So you've got an AWS cloud, and there is hardware somewhere in there, but you're not necessarily responsible for it. Um, it's still something you have to consider, though. Um, given my background in OpenStack, some of the deployments that I've worked on now have an OpenStack layer and then containers on top of that. So you still have to be mindful of the, the fact that there is hardware networking um, as well as the, the software-defined networking on top of that that actual containers talk to each other on. Um, one of the really cool things about containers is that you suddenly have this resource abstraction. So I have an application that I want to run and I know how much RAM and CPU and disk it needs. So I can go out to my cluster of all these machines and say, I need these many resources, and it will intelligently find a space in the cluster for that. This is true for Mesos or Kubernetes or whatever container platform you're using. Resource abstraction is a really huge win when you move over to containers. Um, and then you can schedule a lot of this stuff. So you can tell your container orchestrator I need this many resources at this time. I need to do bursting, so when the load goes up, you add more servers. Um, there's all this really great stuff that you couldn't do when you had to requisition a server and install it in a data center. Um, or when you were using virtual machines and you were waiting a half hour for a virtual machine to spin up. Um, again, you have to worry about the, the virtual networks um, and uh, hardware networks. And one of the things that's really important here is there can be collisions there. Um, so being aware that you have to work with like a hardware networking group as well as what you're doing on your own. Um, I've seen a lot of deployments actually coming from OpenStack where there's like all these overlay networks all over the place. And network performance is terrible because the hardware people aren't talking to the software people. Um, and then on top of all this, you've got your application that's actually running on your cluster. So a containerized system is actually a pretty complicated thing, even though it's sold to you as a really simple solution. Um, so again, you've got like your host platform in the bottom. This could be, this is like your physical machines or virtual machines, whatever you're running your um, container stuff on. And then you've got your actual container and then you've got your application that's running in the container. So I'll sort of refer to this as I go through the talk. And again, this is what they can contain. You've got like Mesos or Kubernetes or Docker Swarm in the bottom and that controls your fleet of machines that has all these resources. You've got your containers, which can be something like a Docker container or a Mesos containerizer, whatever you've got in there. 
and then all of your applications on top. So the first thing I ran into was this idea that containers are the right solution for everyone. Um, of course, I go and I work for a container company, and that's what we want to tell everyone, um, and that they'll solve all your problems. Um, one of the things I was really excited about, aside from resource abstraction, was that high availability is a pretty solved problem in the container space. Um, a lot of the applications that are written for container arch architectures are stateless, so you can tear one down and bring one up. Um, there's a huge use of load balancing in these infrastructures. Um, so it turns out high availability, which I struggled with for years using like Heartbeat and Pacemaker and like cobbling together these Zen systems, um, it was a problem I didn't really have anymore. Um, with containers, they make it really easy with these stateless microservices um, to make high availability, easy, high availability easy. And I was like, that's really great. Something that used to be really, really hard is now much easier. But it turns out you still have to maintain your container infrastructure. Um, one of the first things I asked when I joined coming from an operations background was how do you upgrade these containers? Um, and so they were walking me through the, the infrastructure and they say, we've got these golden images, um, we deploy our application, it runs until you know, maybe it'll die or maybe we update the application. And I was like, well, what if you have one that's sitting out there running for four months, you've never updated the libraries, you've never updated the application, it's working fine, um, like what is, what is your, your strategy there for making sure the libraries are upgraded? Um, and that's something that's not a huge, like, there's a lot of parts that can go into determining these things, um, but in a lot of the container orchestration systems right now, that's not something that's really built in. You still have to pay attention to the fact that you may have this container that's been running for four months and no one paid attention, because it's behaving fine, but it's got a terrible SSL vulnerability. Oops. Um, so you still have to maintain it. Um, and this also goes into things like doing your upgrades on your systems. That was pretty much my second question after like, how do you make sure the containers stay up to date? I was like, well, how do you update the entire cluster? Um, I will say in Mesos, we've gotten better at this story, um, but it is still like a rolling upgrade. Um, and you have to pay attention, you still have to pay attention to the underlying Linux in infrastructure, because um, you're still installing it just on a regular Linux box. Um, but I found with a lot of the people I was working in the container space, um, I don't know, they think Linux is just magic and just runs perfectly all the time. And that has not been my experience all the time. <laughs> um, so there's like, oh, you just upgrade Linux and it's fine. I'm like, well, I mean, usually, but <laughs> when you got problems, you got problems. Um, and also, since you've got this big cluster that's running across all these machines, um, you still have to do things like capacity planning. You have to think about when you're going to resize your cluster, what sort of planning goes into that. Um, you've got things like user management. Um, it's really easy when you toss together a proof of concept and you've got one admin or three admins. You trust them all, right? Um, when your team grows and you actually launch this into production, because the proof of concept always goes into production, right? <laughs> we don't want it to, but it's totally going to end up that way because people start using it. Um, you have to worry about things like user and package management. Um, you have to worry about these networking policies, things that can slow down your network um, because you didn't really think them through or you didn't talk to a network engineer before deploying this thing. Um, Things like backups and disaster recovery, they're not always included in container deployments. Um, I mentioned stateless, and that ends up being a really big thing in container space. And so sometimes people forget, they're like, I don't need backups. I have all these images over here, and I just relaunch my infrastructure. And that's fine in theory, but in practice, not so much. Um, there are always things that change between development and deployment, even though containers do make it easier. Um, one of the things that people always forget about as well until something goes wrong is building in a debugging service into your container infrastructure. Um, one of the hardest lessons I think everyone learns when they first run their first container, they launch their container, something goes wrong, the container dies. And you don't have logs because they were all in that container. And that's a really tough place to be in. You're like, why did that die? I don't know, the logs are gone along with the container. Um, so doing things like maintenance and troubleshooting and baking that into your plan when you pull together a container infrastructure. Another one of my favorites is, uh, you know, our sales guys go out and they're gonna, we're gonna build you this beautiful microservices platform. It's going to be amazing, you're building it from scratch. You've got all these green fields. 
Okay. Every single place I've walked into, it looks like this. <laughs> You've got all of this legacy infrastructure. You have no idea what you're going to pull when you pull one of those string, one of those wires. Like it's just a giant mess. Um, and not only not only is it a mess, and you don't have green fields, which would be lovely. Um, you have a lot of tooling in this infrastructure that you want to keep using. Um, one of the banes of my existence is dashboards. I hate dashboards that every application wants to have. In fact, like DCOS, which I work on, it also has its own very nice dashboard. Um, but they make me crazy because I already have a dashboard. I already have a dashboard that does monitoring for the rest of my infrastructure. I don't want to use every little application having their own dashboard because that's not actually useful to me in an operational perspective. I want things to have an API. I want them to alert me. I want them to be built into the existing infrastructure I have. Um, thankfully, a lot of the container orchestration systems do have APIs and ways to do this. Um, one of the things I've been working on in the Mesos community is with their day two ops group, and they do a lot of exposing of metrics, and they're trying to get more of metrics and logging and things exposed in a generic way so that you can just pipe them into whatever existing tooling you have. Um, because you definitely will have that um, as much as we all want to start fresh. We're not all startups, and we're not all starting from these green fields. Um, and similarly, there's a, there's a few um, initiatives and projects out there to sort of standardize these things across containers. So this is talking about Kubernetes and Docker and Mesos, making sure that all of the container stuff has common interfaces. And so you can switch between them. And so there's some sort of standards and rules there um, when you go to implement a solution. So then it's easier to build into your existing infrastructure. Another myth out there is uh, that everything is automated for you already. Um, I really wish this was the case. Um, because you know the container space gives you the ability to do this because there is an existing infrastructure there um, of APIs and that's one of the things that's super strong about containers is you can actually automate almost anything you want to do. Um, the DCOS which runs on Apache Mesos it doesn't have an autoscaler built in but there's this guy I work with at Microsoft who's written his own autoscaler for Azure so it can auto scale when load gets gets higher, and more importantly, like scale down, which is actually the harder problem. Um, so there's ways to automate everything, um, but it's not necessarily um, built in. Um, you know, the robots are cute and squishy, but actually, if you go into production with this and you don't have very good op automation, it's not going to work well for you. Um, you still need to build in things like logging and metrics and monitoring. Um, and this is sort of where I see containers today. I, I see all of these things getting much better. Um, but I, you know, it's so often that I, I walk, I'm working with a community member, and again, like their container died, um, or their metrics aren't very good because they don't really, they're looking at it from an old systems administration perspective where you have everything in one machine. And when you have this cluster infrastructure, you now have that host and a container and an application. So you've got all these layers of logs. And you don't necessarily have access to all of those things. Um, so you do need to consider this when you're building your system and know that it's not necessarily built into everything. Um, you also want to consider doing centralized logging. Um, of course, this is something that a lot of us have been doing for a really long time. I'd, I was working on OpenStack before this. And centralized logging was hugely important there. Um, so you just have a log server where everything goes. You don't depend on local storage. Um, but it's, it's doubly so important for containers because these machines are gone. Um, they can, they can have, have a lifespan of just a few minutes, depending on your application. So you want to make sure those logs are going to a centralized place that you have access to. Um, you also don't want to be searching around all over your infrastructure to find where the logs are. Um, because you could have an application launch in your container and have it instantly die. You have no idea whether that is because it didn't have enough resources to launch, if there's a problem in the application, if there is a problem in the container itself. You end up with all these layers, all these things that make things like high availability really easy. Um, they make debugging much, much harder. Um, and the same thing, same with logging, metrics should be consolidated. Um, you want these all going into a consolidated metrics tool, preferably one that you're using already for the rest of your infrastructure. Um, so one of the things um, that I've worked on, you just, I mean, CollectD, like we're familiar with this. So you can put everything, as an example, into CollectD 
have this event router, and then you can pipe it out to your storage where you maybe put logs or metricing alerts, um, put it out into a dashboard that's consolidated for your infrastructure, and then also spit this out to some sort of alerting platform. Um, but making sure that everything in your layers, like your host, your application, and your container are all on the same page with the way you do metrics will make your life so much easier because suddenly you have it all in the same place. Um, and then you only have to look in one place. Um, there's a lot of stuff out there to do this. Um, there's proprietary stuff. There's also um, open source stuff. Um, I've run an Elk stack before. It's not super easy, but it's totally doable and it's all open source. Um, and then there's like tooling that does this very in an integrated way for logging. Um, one of the things I really liked about this tool called Sysdig, there's an open source version, they have a proprietary version, um, but they have, they do like host container and application level um, analysis of things. And it was really cool because they install it on a bunch of different things. So you've got in this list, you've got Kubernetes and Mesos and EC, uh, e ECS, OpenShift, um, lots of options for these tools. And Sysdig is just one example. There's a bunch of tools and companies out there who are doing this like container level logging and, and metrics and, and data collection. Um, and one of the things I really liked when I was reading through their documentation was that like they get it. They're like, you need to be monitoring all of your hosts and your apps, your containers, your frameworks and everything. Um, which was nice because I'm like, I know, that's what I've been saying. Because it's so easy to like do this piecemeal um, and each team is, is, you know, the hardware team is monitoring the hardware, the developers are monitoring their applications, and then when you go to debug, everyone's like, I don't know, it's a networking problem. <laughs> um, but having everything consolidated, it makes you get to the solution much faster because then everyone's talking to each other and going from the same playbook. Um, another thing we like to promise people is that you don't have to plan anymore. Microservices will solve everything, so when you talk about um, how much resources you need. You're like, well, I don't really need to plan very much for resources because I'm just running this on a cloud and when I need more, I just add more servers. Okay, your boss will kill you. <laughs> because you actually do need to do planning and be strategic about things, even though it is solving things like, um, um, it does make it easier to scale on demand. Um, you still need to be smart about these things. Um, because things will go wrong in your infrastructure. Um, and when they do, um, it's the most, you know, the first thing you learn is that you have no debugging tools, right? You have no idea how to get to these things. Um, and then within, within your organization, you also have to be communicating with the other people in the stack. Um, so it's part communication, part tooling. And then from there, um, you, you know, you realize you don't have logs. Um, or your logs are being put in a place where you don't have access to them. Um, so planning ends up being a really important part of this. Um, and what I end up seeing when people actually do this is that things like that fall into day two operations and day-to-day -day maintenance, they're not really part of the plan when they go into production. They want their, their application running and they want it to be fast and they want their customers to get to it. But they don't really think of things like six months down the road, we're going to need to do an upgrade, and that's going to be really painful because we didn't plan that time in. Or in three months, when the whole system falls over and nobody knows why, we're like, well, we didn't invest in a logging server. Um, or our metrics are not comprehensive. Um, so making sure that these are actually built into your maintenance plans um, when you put together a deployment um, is really, really important. So um, I put together this checklist, which is sort of like my default things when you're looking to build this container-based um, system. So what I'm saying is you should have a plan for microservices and containers, which considers host, monitoring, logging, metrics, all of that stuff. So everything that's either on your bare metal or in your virtual machine. Um, you want a container level one, so you can figure out what the containers are actually doing. You're spawning up a bunch of containers. Um, are you killing them off when they need to be? Are you retracting them in a way that makes sense? And you're not actually killing off data or processes that people are using. And then something that's watching the container level. Um, and again, these can be different teams, and they very often are in really big organizations because you have the developers watching the applications, and you have the people who are handling the network and the hardware stuff handling the hardware system. Um, you also want to have an upgrade strategy. Um, 
I used to work at HP and we had this really old version of OpenStack for a very long time because it was very hard to upgrade. Um, and that was, that was not great. So having an upgrade strategy from the beginning is going to be really important. Um, and all of these container solutions, they do have upgrade solutions. Um, you just need to read about them and be savvy about implementing them. Um, you want to have backups. And of course we do. We all want backups. Who has 100% backups? OK, I don't really. <laughs> OK, you have one. <laughs> all right, and then, and then disaster recovery. Um, this is one that, that a lot of people are, are very bad at. Um, either they, they, have, they think they have a disaster recovery plan in place. Um, but in reality, they think they do. And then when they actually go to recover from it, it doesn't work. Um, so one of the things I, I heard a talk a couple months ago, and uh, they were talking about having a disaster recovery plan that is maintained by their cloud service. So their cloud service says, we do backups for you. It's fine. It's great. You end up depending on that. And then when you go to roll back, it fails. And the cloud company says, sorry, here's a credit on your account. I mean, technically, that's fine. That's what the SLA says. Like, if this fails, I get a credit on my account. Meanwhile, my business has been down for two days, and now we're going to die. <laughs> it's, it's, it's a bad time. Um, and you just have to remember, like, the motivations of your hosting company are not necessarily aligned with your business. So when you consider things like backups and disaster recovery, recovery you are the one responsible for that. And if it fails, you can't just blame your provider. Um, because at that point, it doesn't matter if you blame their provider. No one has a job anymore. <laughs> um, and then again, just make sure you have metrics um, monitoring. I will say metrics and monitoring are very different things. Um, but I, I just lump them together because you can get a lot of the same data out of the same data sources. Um, but they're often handled differently. Um, and then just centralized logging in some way. So um, that is the conclusion there. Um, maybe a question or two. Horror stories, funny things. <laughs> so you were talking about um, having containers for everything. What about for like managing master services, like for example, free IPA, where you need a master online? Um, so I don't know. It it really. I mean, so. It, you definitely have to make sure when you build into your container infrastructure, if there is one master that needs to be up, um, that the, the framework that is allowing that is, is aware of that. So I mean, I'm most familiar with Mesos, of course. And Mesos has the idea of frameworks. And so in a framework, you define in Mesos, like, you need this master to be up, and the rest of these containers are agents. Um, so the framework itself and Mesos itself knows that one of these needs to be up. And the rest of them, you know, they, they have varying needs um, to, be, to be set up, uh, whether they need to be up, whether they can be rotated, whether they're stateless or not. Um, if the master does need to be taken down, it, it, it has the intelligence to move that over to another place. Um, but a lot of these in container infrastructures, they do have that sort of thing in place where they know if it's built into this framework, whether it needs to be up or not. Um, so those work fine. Like, we're running things like um, Spark and Hadoop and things that actually really, they do have data. And they do need master um, nodes. Um, so they totally work. Um, but again, like you want to deploy these things and find out how well it's working for you. Because you also have to make sure that the disks underlying that are all working well, and especially for data-driven applications. You mentioned monitoring the container versus monitoring the application. I've probably got a a few assumptions about what that looks like. But what, what actually is the difference if you were put it concretely. Right. So when I talk about monitoring the container, what I'm talking about is monitoring all the containers as a whole piece. So being aware sort of in this master agent model that you have enough agents and you have enough masters in the containers themselves. And then when I say application, I'm talking about actually inside the container, the application that's running, and then logging to the disk in the container. Um, because you've got this host level of an operating system, you've got an operating system running in your container, and then you've got your application, which is also spitting out specific logs. Looks like there's one in the back there. There's a lot of talk about um, stateless, idempotent, sort of don't touch it. I work with 
databases. So my encounters with cluster, sorry, container systems are mostly, well, the container just threw away my database. How do I get it back? So my question for you is, how do you manage things that aren't stateless, that don't easily just fail over and automatically scale on things? How do you fit those well within a container infrastructure? Yeah, so for sure, stateless applications is like table stakes as far as containers go. It's super easy. If you just can kill it and bring it back, that's super easy. Um, what a lot of organizations and companies have been doing for the stateful applications is they still use like NASs and other things that are external um, to the container in, um, infrastructure. Um, when I was at MesosCon in Prague a couple months ago, almost every talk I went to, they're like, "Yeah, we're still hosting our stateful service, or, or, or yeah, our stateful services outside of the uh, container cluster." Um, but this is something that is being really strongly worked on um, in the Mesos community. Um, we've been working with other communities. We've been working with like Dell at EMC um, to work on the um, this uh, container storage interface, um, which standardizes the the interface for the containers. So you no longer have to have like a you know this big NAS in the background. Like you have a standard connector for the um, storage um, in the back. So. It's, it's getting there, um, and it's definitely like one of the strongest places where containers is doing a lot of work, both in Kubernetes and Mesos and other places, um, so that we can finally have these really stateful workloads inside of our um, clusters, because it's, it's probably the most important thing for us right now. That is probably all the time we've got. Um, thank, thank you very you. much, Elizabeth.